But in Acts chapter 21, we've been working here, um, and, and, I, and we're so, I mean, I, I can just see, uh, you know, there, there's movies where you just, the buildup of the movies like uh, uh, like two hours, and it's just kind of slow moving, and then all of a sudden that last hour, a ton of stuff happens. And, and I, kind of how I feel with the last seven chapters of, of, uh, of Luke, of Luke, of Luke's account of Acts. I saved that, didn't I? And um, is that is that there's been a lot of stuff that's gone on, and now over the course of these last seven chapters, is we're just dealing with Paul um, standing before uh, Felix and Festus and 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 all the rest of the uh, group going over to Rome uh, on his voyage to Rome, the, sh the the shipwreck. So one would think we'll move quick, but we're still on chapter 21. And we're not going, we're not getting done with that tonight. But we are getting close to the done with it. So, so let's see where, how close we can get Paul to being arrested. Let's just see what we can do, okay? Um, let's start reading at verse. Um, let's go to verse 26. We're just going to step in a little bit uh, to what we were talking about last week. It says, then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple. So signifying the accomplishments of the days of purification. All that means um, is that he went and he said, hey, I'm doing it too. And here's how much longer we have. And then I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of their uh, of their offerings. So he just announced to everybody. It's, it's what they did that, at that point. So until that an offering should be uh, should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, uh, the Jews, which were of Asia, uh, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help, help, help. They needed help. It was dangerous. It was dangerous. Uh, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people. Uh, and the law, and this place, and further brought Greeks also into this temple, and have polluted the holy place. For they have, uh, for they'd seen, now, now notice what they say in verse 29. We're going to go through this a little bit. For they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus, an Ephesian, uh, or, yeah, an Ephesian from Ephesus, uh, Ephesiosius, uh, whom they, uh, never mind me, uh, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Uh, and, and we're going to get into that in a second here. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, drew him out of the temple, for with uh, the doors were shut. And in verse 31, it says they're about to kill him. So uh, now, the, now again, they're about to kill him. And I, I, my, my reading this over and over again, I kind of feel like they, they maybe started roughing him up, but were limited on what they could do uh, because uh, someone comes to the rescue. But I got to stop here. And again, most of y'all going, Pastor Thad, uh, I didn't see anything here that, that's really earth shattering. So why don't you keep moving on and see how much we can get cover? And I said, I did though. There was just a couple words that really stuck out at me. So let's do a little bit of teaching here and, and we'll get to that point. So it says, when, when the seven days were almost ended, and it seems, uh, seems apparently, remember last week when we were de dealing with uh, the Nazarite vow and Paul picked it up to join them in the rest of it, uh, which again, I'm guessing seven days wasn't a real, unless he really needed a haircut. Uh, seven days wasn't a real big thing regarding uh, growing his hair and all that kind of stuff. But he, but he said, I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to, I'm going to hang out with you. I'm going to, I'm going to pay your, I'm going to pay your offerings and all that kind of stuff. And apparently there seemed to be about a week left. Uh, there's no other real pictures here. It doesn't say they started over again or anything on that order. He just picked up, said, I'm with you. I'm standing with you. I'll, I'll go in with you. I'll pay your, uh, I'll pay the offerings that, that you have to pay. And so it appears about seven days left. Uh, could it have been more sure? Could it have been less? I don't know. But apparently he's now getting ready to go in when the seven days were almost done to start paying, uh, getting the offerings and, and taking care of the offerings for all five of them. Um, and, and again, I, I've read it. I, I, I spent probably more time than I ought to trying to figure out all the details of what it's talking about here. And, and everybody else's guess was as good as mine. 
And so I really took their get, I took their words for it because they're a little bit more scholarly. I'm not saying they're better teachers. I'm just saying they're more scholarly. And they seem to think that about the, about seven days remaining, and when he went in to the temple in order to start taking care of the offerings that needed to be paid. Um, now it says that when he was in that process of doing that, some men from Asia. Which again, Asia, uh, we're not going to pull up the map, but if we, uh, remember Asia, when it mentions Asia, uh, I think it was his second missionary journey. Um, he's, he was going through the, uh, the Lystra, the Derby, the Iconium. He was going through that, that group of, of, of cities that he had visited his first one. And it said he wanted to go into Asia, but God said, no, I want you to go up into Macedonia. And the important part of that was Macedonia church became very important. Philipp, Philippians became very important to him in financing his ministry. Uh, so, so he wanted to go into Asia and, and, and the main church, the main city in Asia was Ephesus. God said, no, that's not for right now. But his third missionary journey, he spent three years in Ephesus and it was Asia. So, so when you're spending three years uh, in some, in some place and you are literally changing the landscape of that city, you're driving, um, you're driving, uh, cultic practices and, and and things like that out of business, um, and 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 then when you're if you're doing it that you're also messing with the synagogue and and all of their followers, all the Jewish followers, and so they they seem to be the ones. Uh, remember here, and I, I know I'm ahead of myself in my notes, but remember last week uh, when when James said, "Hey, look, we have got a problem here. There's a lot of word around here that you are." Uh, that, that you're telling people they don't pay attention to the law, don't pay attention to Moses, don't pay attention to circumcision, don't pay attention to that kind of stuff, and that's all that. Then it's it's bad for us to do that. We need to get that uh, dealt, uh, taken care of. Apparently, these men from Asia um, were probably the ones earlier who said, "Hey, this is the guy's telling you about." That, that, that's exactly that's really what they said. That's the that's the uh, what was it in verse uh, uh, crying out, "This is the man." Remember, we, we, we've been telling you in the past years, this is the man that teaches this stuff, um, which, okay, I've got to stop there because I'm, I'm wanting to go out of order here. And I think it's important that we stay in the order of what I have. You may ask yourself, that's a long way to travel just for a festival. Now, again, it was, it was, a, it was a long festival. Um, go ahead and throw the map up there. Have you, do you have it up there today? I don't know if you do or not. Yeah, because it's the, got the red logo up there. Give me the white one. Because we need to have that over there. Um, Ephesus is over here, and that's—I mean—that's quite a journey. Yes, it's by by sea, and and, and uh, maybe that's a, a common thing. I don't know, um, but that's quite the journey from Ephesus there. And, and so some of us would simply say, uh, "Is that common? Why were these men over in Jerusalem uh, at at this time?" Uh, it's. Uh, you know, it was, was this just per chance? You know, have you ever had those kind of things where you think maybe it's just a fi- divine appointment? And then, then someone goes, no, they're always here. Um, you know, if, if you went to Walmart on Monday afternoon and you're like, you saw me and you go, oh, divine appointment. Pastor uh, Thad was there. No, I'm always there on, on Monday afternoons. Um, I, I'm, I'm always there most days. Uh, so it's chances are it's not that great a, a coincidence. Um so is, is it that uncommon? And the, and the truth is, the answer is, it wasn't that uncommon for, uh, you, you, for getting people all around the world, the known world, to be in, uh, Jews to, to meet in Jerusalem. Um, because, again, they were getting ready to celebrate the Passover. Recall Paul saying I wanted to, he wanted to get in there for Passover? Um, they're getting ready to celebrate Passover, and and during festivals, uh, feasts, Jerusalem was hopping. Um, let's let's pause here. Just really uh, go back to. Don't have to turn there. I'm just making reference here. Acts two, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and they were all in the upper room, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they spilled out into the streets. And one of the things that is noted is that the 120-ish people, could have been more, could have been less, 120 is noted in chapter 1. 
So it could have been more, could have been less, but they were all there in that one accord. Uh, when they spilled out into the street, it said that all the men heard uh, them speaking in these languages that were their own native languages. Well, if everybody that was in that city was only uh, Israelites or, or Jews, they would have all spoke similar. You know, if they, if it'd be like, be like, you know, if they're all in Moorhead, they'd all just be in, like we're all from the country or Lewis County or whatever, you know. And they had that, they had that twang in their voice, but uh, but that they maybe. Uh, <laughs> and that th- they had all different types of dialects, all different types of styles, all different types of accents, and they're all. And, and how would that have been unless they came from all over to get there? Now, here's one of the things I want to teach you, teach you a little bit on, and, and this is not the main point, but we'll see. Um, there's another reason that this wasn't unusual for them to get there, much more than just Jews came in from all over and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the first things, uh, there's some of you that may not really under, know, know this. Um, we, uh, Grace Fellowship started back in about uh, 2001-ish, uh, I think, um, in uh, here. And we started over in uh, the Cornerstone Plaza. And then we left there and went up on First Street. And then... And then uh, uh, and then there was another church here, uh, which they, you had several different names, didn't you? Um, but uh, but they were they had been a couple different places, but they had set up camp here, and then their pastor um, just moved to Somerset like overnight. Uh, it was kind of like one of those things. Hey, this is my last Sunday, and and it was gone. And so they were kind of concerned. They needed a pastor. They didn't know what to do. Uh, I think it was pa- Brother Randy, I believe, said. There's a good pastor up there, and we got, and I don't know. Uh, so long process is we became, we merged our churches together. Um, we didn't really realize it, uh, but there was a group of them that had one foot out the door before we ever showed up. Uh, so, uh, so that was kind of interesting. But what God remained, what, what remained was priceless treasures. Amen. Um, but when we got here, there was a couple that were here. There were, there were several that stayed around. Um, and, and one of them came up to me at one point uh, shortly after and said, I need to know where our, what part of our tithe is going to feed the orphans and the widows. And, and I was like, none at this point. We're not, we don't have anything. And they said, well, that's why I tithe is to feed the orphans and widows. I'm like, that's not the main purpose of the tithe. And and and, uh, and and really, what that went down to is they didn't really didn't they didn't have an understanding of Old Testament tithe, and they should have that that, that the person that asked me should have understood it because he because he uh, he really has a knack he really enjoys the Old Testament types and symbols. Um, but what you don't understand is that in the Old Testament under Jewish law there were three tithes that were required. The first law is the one that the first tithe is the one that we understand. It, it was given to them. We're not going to turn there, but in Numbers chapter 18, it was given to them. It's little, it's, it's considered what is called the Levitical tithe, or it's the sacred tithe. It's the tithe that's holy under the Lord. It's that tenth that we bring, uh, that we bring consistently. We bring they would bring it every year because that was when their harvest would come, and that's when their of what we bring it consistently as we increase. Uh, whenever we bring increase in, which would be a weekly thing. That's, the, that's that tithe. That's that tithe that's holy unto the Lord. That's the tithe that you bring to the, that's the tithe they would bring to the priests that worked the ministry in the, in the tabernacle in the temple. Uh, it came to the priest. The priest enjoyed that. That, that was what the, the, the priest's pay was. That's one of the things where in Malachi it says, uh, uh, bring all your tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And, I, and I've, I, in the past, I'd always sat there and just simply said, said, meet, supply, make sure the air's on, make sure the lights are on, make sure the water's running, make sure the bills are paid, all that kind of stuff, make, make sure there's meat. That's, that's, there's nowhere in Scripture where, uh, where meat is identified as supplies, uh, you know, gas, and all that kind of stuff. But meat is talked about, uh, about the word. When you should be on the meat, 
you're still on the milk. And there's a lot of churches with a lot of milk because their pastors are working another job and have to try to come home and, and have, they have job, they have family time, they have to try to find time to get a word. And so he said, so, so I, I believe, I, I, you know, it's been years ago that I believe the main purpose of the, the tithe is to take care of the man of God so that he can get the word of God so that you can, so, so that you can grow, so that you can uh, be increased. Because of how it goes, it also keeps the lights on. It also makes sure we do all that kind of stuff because otherwise the man of God would have to go do that. But that, honestly, all that stuff should be offerings. But I'm not going to get into that. So that was the first one. And that was, that's the one that we're most common with. The second one is what is really a tithe of the feasts. Uh, and this was an annual one. This was one you did every, when you brought in your harvest, uh, and you brought in, you know, the, the calves had their, had their babies. You brought one to the, um, you, you brought a tenth or whatever to the, uh, to the priests. For the, for the Levitical tithe, and then you brought one for the feasts. In other words, the whole purpose of that was is that, you know, Pastor Lisa would take her new heifer and sell it, and then what she got for that heifer, she set back so that she could pay her way to go to Jerusalem for the next feast, for the feast of that year. You follow me on that? This is a savings account. It'd be kind of like you taking, uh, you know, your first tenth. You know, you get paid a thousand dollars a week. You take a hundred dollars and you give it to the church. You take the next hundred dollars and you put it in a uh, conference uh, thing because you're going to go down to Texas and and enjoy uh, Southwest Believers Conference. And so every time you get paid, one tenth goes into a savings account so that when when it comes around time for that conference, you're you're you're, you're you have your way paid. You don't have to sit there, I want to go so bad, but I don't have any money. No, no, you have money. So that was the second one. The third tithe. So here's what I, I, this guy didn't understand when he was asking me about the widows and that, is that he was, I don't know if that was giving 10%. He may have been given 10%. I don't know what he was given. That was not my job uh, to, to identify how much he was given. Um, but until he was given that third tenth, he, none of that money is to go to. Yes, I know it can. I'm not. But that, it, the purpose of the tithe is not to take care of the widows until that third tenth. And that third tenth was only one time every three years. So you didn't do it two years. And then the third year, you brought a third tithe. And, and so, so, so that's, we really, I mean, understanding is wonderful. Wisdom is a wonderful thing. And, and so, so when you understand that, hey, if you, if you want, some of our tithe to go, make sure that you're bringing your tenth, make sure you're putting money back for, uh, for uh, feasts or conferences, and then bring your third tithe and, 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 and designate it for the, the widows and the orphans. Amen. I, take care of them. Whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. So yes, take care of them. But I said all that to say this is that the Jewish people took it very seriously to go to the, uh, to go to the feasts. And, and, and so they would, they would put back their tithe every year for that purpose. And so it wasn't unusual for them uh, from, from Ephesus to tri- uh, make a trip over and, and, to, uh, and, and, and to visit Jerusalem. Amen? So it was extremely common. Therefore, that's one of those things that I want to say is that, uh, and I made that before, is that these men that were there that time probably had been there at least the three years that every three years, every year during that three years that Paul was in Ephesus, they were probably back there for the Passover every year. And when they would get back there, guess what they would tell them? There's a man out there preaching, Paul, Paul, the apostle, Paul of Tarsus, no, Paul, yeah, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul. He's and he's teaching. He's teaching these people uh, weird things, and he's telling he's telling uh, us as Jews up there that we shouldn't be listening to the mosaic, you know, all that kind of stuff. They, they were the ones that were spreading that God, that rumor. That's how it got there. Amen. Uh, so, uh, so, so understanding is wonderful. 
But then notice what it says here um, in verse 29. Well, we can actually go back there to verse 28 where it says, And further, he brought Greeks, Gentiles, into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. And then, now this is their attempt. Verse 27 says they're stirring the people up. They're trying to get them angry. They're trying to get them to respond in, in horrible ways. They're trying to get them angry at Paul. And, and, um, and so he, he's stirring them up. And, and verse 29, here, here's, here's, here's how things work. We saw Paul and Tro, uh, Trophimus hanging out in the city. So you just know that Paul has no respect for the temple, and he brought a Gentile into the temple. You know he's brought the he know he's brought Trophimus into the temple. You know I don't have, I'm not going to teach on it tonight. I I, I was listening to a uh, a sermon of mine. Uh, my favorite preacher. No, I'm, I'm, I was listening to a sermon of mine. I've, I've been I've been trying to work in, at getting little five-minute ex- excerpts to put on Facebook and stuff like that. And I'm just not very good at it because my five-minute, I, oh, I need this point in there too. I need this point. And I really don't. But I just, but, but one of the things I was, uh, points I brought out was, because there's the scripture where I talked about the, the, the deception of opinions, how when you, when you live with your opinion on stuff, and, and that's what we're living with. We're living in a time where opinions, people's opinions mean more to them than the word of God. And, and, uh, and, and so it, it, it just, it was that, but it, the point is, is that when, when you, uh, when you become, uh, when you start operating by your opinions, you become the judge and you start judging people. And, and, and when they, when they do something, you, you're, you make a, you know, this is what they meant to do. This is what they were thinking. Do you know that this is what they're doing at home? You know, somebody that uh, I, I brought out an illustration in that series, uh, that church about about how you know I it kind of it, it, it I don't like it, uh, but but it kind of annoyed me for a while when people would come into the church late, and they're just like, "Can't don't you love God anymore?" And 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 you know, how many of those people just were at home? And, uh, trying to get one kid dressed, and they get one kid dressed, and and then they go work, start working on the other one, and the first one decided to get undressed and get, and, and 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 go play again, and and you know, and, and it's just a constant battle of just trying to get them ready and all that kind of stuff. And so when they come to church, they're glad they made it, you know. But that is none of my business. Yes, as a pastor, I'm like, yeah, let's get here and let's come in and have expectation. But it's none of my business of judging why you were late. That's, that's none of my business. That's a, but we, we have tendency to judge people's hearts. And that's what judging is all about, is the hearts, the attitude behind why they do something, not what they do. Sin is sin. But when you start saying, this is why they do it. If, if I looked at, if I looked at, at, at somebody with that, with that attitude, with that face, um, this, I would have been, you know, and so this is what they're meaning by that. Well, maybe they just had gas. Maybe they didn't mean anything by that. They just had gas. You know they're going. Oh, mm-hmm. Why? Why they look at me like that? I can't believe they, they. They they must be they must be angry. They must be this. They, and you start you start you know. And, and and that's what these guys are doing is they're 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 literally judging a man simply because he walked with a, a gentile in public, and they're using that they're they're taking that and they're making accusations. You know you know he brought them into the temple. You know he defiled this place. Now it's really important to understand here. That it's absolutely prohibited for Gentiles to enter in uh, beyond the court of the Gentiles, where they where they could gather. Uh, but but to go any further into the temple grounds, it was it, it was absolutely forbidden. Signs were posted which read both in Greek and Latin: "No foreigner may enter uh, within the barricades which surround the temple enclosure." That anyone in, anyone who is caught trespassing, besides you know Jews. Uh, uh, will bear personal responsibility for um, for his ensuing death. So in other words, you're going to get you're going to die if you walk into. So this was a no-no. Roman law even honored the temple to the point that they gave the te- if a Roman Gentile individual went in too far, 
that they gave the Jews right to kill them. So what they were doing is they were trying to get a verse. You've allowed them in here, so you're taking responsibility. We're going to kill you. Right? Now, see, this is bothering me. This, this, this was bothering me, and I, and I know it shouldn't bother me. Um, it's over, right? Um, but what, what I was reading this, and again, I'm sitting there just like I've done every week thinking, how, to, how do I, do I just read it and go, there you go, let's go home? Or is there something you want to show me, the Holy Spirit, uh, show me, uh, show us, Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit pointed in on a couple words in verse 27. Notice what he says, what it says here. It says, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people. Now, what hit me when I saw that was stirring up all the people. What is the scripture over in uh, Ephesians? Is what, yeah, Ephesians, I'm, I'm sure that's where it's at. Um, it's in Hebrews, excuse me. Uh, where, yeah, Hebrews 10. He says, Provoke one another to good works. Remember that? In other words, stir one another up. Agitate one another to do good things. Well, here, they're agitating one another. They're stirring people up for destruction. And, and, and it just, it really kind of got a hold of me that, um, that what they're doing is, is dangerous. I mean, we don't, we, we, we don't even have to try to pretend that what they're doing is not bad. You know, it's like, no, oh, it could be some good. No, it's wrong. It's not scary. Go over to James chapter 3. It's not scriptural, it's not spiritual, and it's not, it's not godly. Because what they're doing is they're, they, they are, they're agitating people to bad things. And, and I, I really don't know, I, I've... I spent all day studying on this and last night studying on this, and I don't have much of any other way to put it. Uh, but, but they're agitating people, stirring people up towards bad, to do wrong. And, and uh, in, in James chapter 3, verse 13, uh, it says, who is, wise, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of his good conversation, that word conversation um, is lifestyle, it's not, I mean, it's not your words. It's just your lifestyle. It's, it's an it's a old English word. Um, it, it just confused, just enough to be confusing, make you have to seek it. Let him show out of his good, his good lifestyle, his works with meekness and wisdom. Yieldedness. Now, meekness isn't weakness. But it's yieldedness to the things of God. And again, I'm not, we're not going to get there. We're going to close up on that. I think on Sunday, the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he's just dealing so much in that area of our, of our attentiveness to the things of God, honoring the things of God, honoring the, the heart of God, and, and, and surrendering to that. And, and that's really this picture of if, if you're going to walk in, in, in wisdom, it's about, it's about living your life out um, in meekness and wisdom. Verse 14, but if, in, if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts. Now, we understand what envy is. We understand envy is just that jealousy, that, 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 and, it's, and it's bitter. It's, 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 it's just an anger at somebody for what they have, for, uh, for who they are, for what they possess. Um, but if you have bitter envy and strife, and that strife is that stirring up. Strife is stirring up anger, stirring up bitterness, stirring up uh, things where, uh, you know, it, it, it's the opposite of peace. It's the opposite of calmness. And so it says if you are, uh, it, it, this is the opposite of, uh, of, uh, of a good conversation of meekness and wisdom. This is bitterness, this is envy, and this is strife. You're angry at somebody and so you, you, uh, you, Cause an agitation in the atmosphere. Have you ever been angry at somebody and everybody nearby you could just feel it in the atmosphere? 
my my one of uh, I, the first place that I was a youth pastor at. I was grateful. I mean, I met my wife there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad for every moment I had there. Um, but towards the end, I'd been I'd been feeding uh, increasingly on Kenneth Copeland and in the Word of Faith, and and uh, and the pastor just didn't agree with those lines. Um, it's funny. It's funny because now they believe closer to what we believe, but they didn't believe it at all. And um, and so he would he would get up in front and he would he would identify the the confession group of people as name it and claim it, blab it and grab it group and with, with real antagonism. But you know, most of the people were, and I would sit there and I would be, it would, it would burn me up because it was so disrespectful because he's, he's messing with something he doesn't understand. He's not studied. Um, matter of fact, something that he would agree with that he, if he heard it under, if he actually heard it and it really bothered me. Um, and, and I, I, I just sat and my wife tells me I'm not a good liar. I'm not a good deceiver is that if I, if I'm, uh, if I'm annoyed at somebody, uh, you can tell, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't hide it. Well, uh, there was a lady who I, I don't need to get in there. I, I just, I, and I, I just don't. And apparently I wasn't that day because another lady, uh, across the, um, church just happened to glance on me and she looked at my face and the Holy Spirit said, he's not going to be here for much longer. But I could have, I could have stood up. I could have, I could have caused anger in that. I could, in that church, I could have, I could have inserted some strife. I could have stirred up some agitation, but that would have been wrong. It's truth isn't wrong. But when you start stirring up and going against people, especially the pastors of churches, and you're creating an atmosphere of, of, of strife, it's wrong. Yes. That's why we need, we need to create. But, it's, but notice it says, glory not. Don't, don't think you're big big deal because, because I set that person straight. That person now knows the truth. I've, I let them know. I told everybody what they did. Now, now they can't come in and lie and, 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 and fool, try to fool everybody. I, I set them straight. Don't glory. Don't think you're a big deal. Because operating in that way, and, and this is and this is real important, is, is uh, earthly, it's sensual, so it's fleshly, and it's devilish. When you are doing what these men did in Acts, and you're stirring up people, and you're, and you're creating a hostile atmosphere, and you're causing strife, and you're causing bitterness, and you're operating in that way, you are, you, it is a devilish mentality. You are actually operating in the demonic. I am not saying you're demon-possessed. Don't, that's, that's, uh, no, I'm, not, I'm saying you're operating in the demonic. The, the enemy is the one that you're yielding to. Um, verse 15. This wisdom descendeth, oh, I, I, I did, I just, it descendeth not from above, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Verse 16. For where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above. Now, now notice these words that identify how we need to be operating uh, in our in our lives, what needs to be coming out of our lives is pure, peaceable, and gentle, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hip, hypocrisy. So when these men came and and did they deem now, now they knew they were lying, but did they deem what they were doing is necessary because uh, you know these Christians were were separating from the Jewish faith and all that? Did they deem what they were, they possibly did? But because they came up and stirred and agitated negative in negative ways and caused strife and turmoil, what they did was wrong. And, and we have got to, we've got to make sure we understand that. When you're operating godly or acting like God, it will, you, you won't be aggressive or destructive and, or cause discord. It will be pure, peaceable, and gentle. 
Now that word provoke simply means that. I, I, I mentioned that word in Hebrews chapter 10 where it says provoke one another to good works. Well, when we think of provoke, we're thinking of it's a call to action. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're inciting a, a movement, right? Um, you're stirring up a crowd. And God says we're supposed to, but we're not supposed to do it that way. My question to you today is how do you provoke others? Do you provoke them to godly things or destruction? Do you provoke them to be closer to God or further? Do you provoke them to walk in peace or stir up strife? Do you provoke them to achieve goals or to, or to, uh, or to move towards failure? Now go over to Galatians 5. I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures. I, I, I'm, I'm, I am aware of the time. It doesn't mean I pay attention to it. I am aware of it. There's two totally different things. But I, I want to just uh, get this point in us. That we've got to make sure, and, and, and boy, does, if this doesn't flow with everything we've been talking about ever since Paul uh, set shore in Syria, where uh, where he was in uh, uh, Tyre, you know, the hospitality, the, all that kind of stuff. If it doesn't fit in this flow of, of making sure that we're provoking the right way. And again, you might be right. But if you if you're operating in strife, and dissension and discord, then you're wrong. God wants to uh, wants us to love people into the kingdom, love people in, into right. Pro All right, Pastor Lisa is messed up. <laughs> She's doing stuff that we that we don't agree with at all, and so I go over to Beulah. And I fill Beulah's head up with it. Don't listen to anything she said. When she gets up there and does her offering, I don't want to correct her or anything, but when she gets up there and does her offering, don't pay attention. Get, get your phone out. Get, your, get, your, get a book out. Just go bring a, bring a novel and start reading it, Ruth. And, 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 and turn, turn your back on her. Everybody, and then I'm, 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 I'm telling uh, Lisa Bistrick, go to the bathroom when, when she gets up there. Don't pay attention to her. Don't talk to her. Don't do that. Just... <laughs> I know, I understand. Well, that's, that's my point. That's kind of my point here, is that I, I'm agitating people against her, and I'm creating a, a hostile. And so, so now she walks in, and nobody's going to talk to her. Hey, Pastor Lisa. Or, or she goes, hi, Beulah. And Beulah goes, what's going on? <laughs> Sister Ruth took her for the ride here, and then, and then, but didn't talk to her the whole way. And, and is, is there something wrong? I can't, I can't talk to you about it. You, you follow me? Is that I've, I've done it where I've agitated the atmosphere. I've created an atmosphere of strife and, and resentment and discord. And, and, uh, and, 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 and one of these, Pastor Lisa's going to finally start come repents and said, I've messed up so bad. Or we can just love her. We can maybe even speak the truth in love. We just we can love, love love her into correction, and again I understand that there's sometimes and there's some people though going and telling them that they're wrong may not be taken that well and well, but loving them, you follow me on that? Oh no, man, anything but love. All right, but in Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-five. And here's, here's a negative connotation to this word provoking. It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Okay, so we're just talking about walking in the Spirit, uh, living for God, walking in, in, in accordance with His will the way He wants us to. Verse 20, 26, let us not be desirous of vainglory or conceit, provoking each other, envying one another. Uh, the New Living Translation just simply says, let us not be full of self-glory, uh, making one another angry, um, having envy of one another. Which tells me that to stir up agitation and strife in an in a, in a, in a atmosphere, the root of that is conceit or selfishness and envy. Which again, James already told us it was envy. Bitter envy. But it's conceit. It's selfishness. 
It's me. It's me feeling like I'm the judge. It's me thinking I know what's best. It's me wanting my way. Matter of fact, it seems to point the way to I'm not getting everything I want. And so I'm going to talk against Kenneth Copeland. Listen. There are pastors around this globe. And I know people say, I don't think that's how it works, Pastor Thad. But, but James chapter 3, verse 1 tells us it's how, it's how it works. There are pastors around this globe that when they stand before God, they will have to answer for what they spoke against Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle, Jesse Duplantis, that group of men. They will have to answer for, 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 for standing in front of their people and telling a group of people that these men are money grubbers and, they're, and, they, and they... You say, well, Pastor Thad, what if they are? That's none of my business. If I am agitating and creating a strife against other people, other people in the body, other children of God, God says, don't touch my anointed. Amen. And that means don't touch, don't touch uh, th- those ministers that you may not agree totally with. Listen, one of the, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of the pastors that his style, I, I don't know that I could sit under it long term. It's just not the style. I, I, I want to get in the word. I want to get deep in the word. And it's Stephen Furtick. But dude, I ain't messing with him. Oh, but Pastor Thad, he's got bad intentions. That ain't my call. I will never stir up anybody against Stephen Furtick. Well, what if you find out? What kind of statement is that? Is that saying something like what, what, the, what these men were saying? And saying, hey, we've put two plus two together. And if I had a church that big a size, and I had a ministry that big a size, I would, I would cheat on my wife. I would drink. I would smoke. I would chew. I'd go with girls that do. I, if, if I had a church that, yeah, you're telling yourself when you're telling them. He's, he's not my style, but my goodness, I've listened to him a couple times, and I've gotten some good, simple points off of him that, I mean, a couple of them I've, I've, I've used here. And so if someone can listen to him and grow in hunger for the things of God, then who cares if I prefer Bill Johnson over him or Rick Renner over him? That ain't none of my business. My business is to love Stephen Furtick. To speak peace over him. To speak love over him. Hallelujah. But not to provoke. Not to, not to create people. I'm not, see, when I, when I get you all to try to act mean towards Pastor Lisa, because I want to try to prove her a point, I am causing you to sin. I'm, I'm, I've, made you, I've, I've become a stumbling block to you. Bible says things like soft answer turneth away wrath, but wrongful words stir up anger. I love Proverbs 29 verse 11. It says a fool uttereth all of his mind, but a wise man keeps it until afterwards. Just because you have something to say doesn't mean you should say it. And that goes for Facebook. You need to stop. As your fingers are going or your thumbs are going and you say, is this edifying? Is this wisdom or am I stirring up wrath? I know a man who would be considered in most circles that, that I, of, of the people I know, who would be considered spiritual. I believe he's been ordained under Grace Ministries. Um, and, and he's, he, I don't know that he has a church. I don't know if he's ever had a church, but, um, but, but he lives, he's out of, he's out of Kentucky. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm friends with him. 
on Facebook, but he's one of the most annoying people I'll ever, uh, ever see post because he'll say stuff like this. He'll say stuff like, here's my two cents. And then he'll say something that makes, it's gonna, he knows it's going to make half the people angry. He's gonna, it's going to stir up strife. So, Pastor Thad, everything's going to stir up strife. If I post that God's good, some people's not going to... Uh, no, no, you share the word. Be instant in season and out of season. But, but I mean, I'm not saying that he's sharing the word. He's making some um, uh, uh, accusation and stuff like that. And, and I sit there and I'm like, who, who do you think you are, Mr. Big Shot? Right? Who made you the Lord to where you're going to make all you're doing? And I want to tell them, I want to say, all you're, all you're doing is trying to get people annoyed. And you know, sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut. I, I want to tell them, keep your two cents and stay out of strife. It may be all you have. Uh, ver- Psalm 15 verse 18 says, A wrathful man stirs up strife. The interesting thing about that word wrathful is that one of the words that, that, that is used for that word wrathful is poison. If you're a person that creates strife, you're a poison. You're deadly. You're, you're going to hurt somebody. Don't don't allow yourself to be that. Don't allow yourself. <laughs> Proverbs, I, I, I have a lot of them here, but I'll, I'll finish with this one. It just simply Proverbs twenty six says, if no one stokes a fire, it'll go out. <laughs> but see here, the thing the thing that the Holy Spirit's telling us is that quit stoking the fires that stir up strife and start stoking the fires that stir up the best in other people. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. I'm wrapping this thing up. You know, the the Bible has, I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. But when when you talk about stirring up and all that kind of stuff, and on that, I I was, it was easier to find all these scriptures that, um, about bitterness and wrath and all that kind of stuff. But notice what it says here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Isn't it funny that as we see the day approaching, people are becoming more opinionated and more strife-stirring? Isn't it, isn't it interesting? And God says, as you see the day approaching, make sure that you that you consider one another and provoke one another to good works, to love. I mean, the, 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 a couple things to, to point, point out here is that um, this type of provoking is driven by that first word where it says, consider one another. Remember, the other one is driven by conceit. What about me? This one is driven by, I'm, what about you? Which is exactly, oh, no man, anything but love. Prefer, in honor, preferring the others above yourself. When your focus is on other people and you desire to see them succeed, you're not driven by envy. And you're pushing them, you're, you're pushing them towards love, towards good works, and towards being stronger. That's why we go to church, to encourage others. How do we do that? You do it by showing them how it looks. Show them love. Show them patience. Show them joy. Challenge them that it can be done just simply by living it out. See, my, my I, I want to ask you a question, and and I don't, I want I, I'll I, think of anybody in, in this room or outside this room. But I'm going to ask you a question. I, I, I was going to have you kind of maybe do it. I was going to put some people on the spot. I'm not going to for time's sake. But who's the first person that comes to your mind when you think of joy? And not, not, not the name. Well, Joy Fields or Joy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Who's the first person that you think of when you're like, man, 
I need some joy, so I need to hang around. How about peace? I need the atmosphere around me changed. I need to go be around this person. How about patience? Is there somebody that, that you know that's the face of patience? How about lovely? I'm not talking about beautiful. I'm just talking about just there's something about a person. That... See, I, I was, I, I, I was going to have you do that because I was hoping that I would fit into at least one of those. <laughs> that that, that if, if I wanted to laugh or if I want, I, I, just, I, I just like to be around Pastor Thad because I know he's going to at least make me smile. He's going to at least. That's the thing is I just, I, just, I, I love the fact that that's our church has that has that atmosphere of joy. It's not oppressive, it's not heavy. It's just joy. That we laugh. And it's okay to laugh. But see, whose life is that is that life that provokes you to smile? Amen. Just, just those things to ask. But, but, you know, how do you provoke? By saying it. Let them hear what they can do. Not what their limitations are. Are your words encouraging, strengthening, increasing others? Or are they doing the other? Discouraging others? I've told you before about the man, I believe it was in town. If it's not in town, it's in, in nearby community. Who thwarted a minor revival simply because he spoke to a lady and said, the clothes that you're wearing is, we wear dresses here. Women wear dresses here. Pants are unacceptable. And by that one statement of, of, of stirring up something, he didn't even stir up. Pastor didn't care. Why would he care? But by stirring that one thing up, he caused half the church to leave. And, that, and, and, and they, where they were before that minor revival, they were below that. Do your words stir people up to believe that they, uh, towards revival or backsliding? towards achieving their goals and their dreams or away from it. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but only, only that which is good to the use of edifying, provoking, that it may minister grace, ability to the users. When someone's done talking to you, are they closer to God or further. Now, I'm conclusion here. We are met with decisions every day of our lives. To decisions to provoke people to good or to provoke them to bad. We have decisions by our lifestyles and words to push people towards the things of God or towards the things of this world. Beloved, don't allow yourself to be caught in that place of leading people into that place of danger, of poison. I'm going to, you ready? How would you like it if someone finds themselves standing before the great white throne judgment? That's, that's for sinners. And they hear the words, depart from me, for I never knew you. And their only argument was, yeah, but Pastor Thad said, yeah, but Pastor Thad did this. Our lives need to be the lives that people can look at, hear, and be around. And want to be closer to God. Be the reason. Somebody is serving God. Be the reason. People are achieving their dreams. Be the reason. They are living. For God. Stir them up. Provoke them to good. Not to attack. Amen. Let's stand together.
Hallelujah. Beauty of Bible study. You hear the same thing every week, don't you? Oh, man, God challenges fresh every, every week. Something fresh, something good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I think Pastor Lisa made mention of this um, a couple weeks ago. I forget how she, what, what the context was. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when it comes to people, we can be real quick to point out their shortcomings and their failures. And I've preached this before that when it comes to people's failures, when people talk to you about their failures and how they've messed up, it would be better to be called naive and just stand and say, no, I don't think that's, that's it at all. I don't, I don't see that at all. But no, pastor, you got to understand, this is what they meant. This is what they did. This is who they are. I don't see that. It would be better for to have people say, well, you're naive, than for you to join in at that place of strife. Amen. Amen. And so I just, you know, wrap it all up in one word, just love. Let's just love one another. I'm not saying we don't correct. That's part of scripture. But we just love. Because that's when we all can now prosper, increase in safe environments. Amen. Amen.